Hi, I'm Clyde Haberman. Welcome to the New York Times Close Up. I'll be filling in for Sam Roberts. It's been 14 months now since supporters of President Trump stormed the Capitol building. The images are hard to forget. Insurrection is scaling the building, smashing in windows, trashing the offices of Congress people, not to mention the deaths of several people. And all done at the urging of the sitting president, who persuaded his followers to attempt to decertify the results of the 2020 presidential election. A week after that, President Trump was impeached for incitement of insurrection, and the fallout has continued. Now, as of this March, we have close to 800 people who've had charges filed against them, two leaders of two of the extremist groups that were involved in the advance planning leading to up to the January 6th riot have been indicted, one on serious conspiracy charges. Joining me is Alan Foyer, who has been following the legal and political fallout from the breach of the Capitol. Welcome, Alan, and thank you for joining us. Uh, can you bring us up to date on where we are and what, what kind of trials going ahead can we expect that, that you're going to particularly focus on? Sure. So to date, there have been two trials connected to January 6th. The first resulted in a conviction at the beginning of this month, and it was a guy from Texas named Guy Wesley Reffitt, who was a member of what was called the Texas Three Percenters Militia Group. And he was um, found guilty essentially of leading a charge up a staircase outside the building um, and while he was carrying a pistol. Um, and then just this week, there was another conviction of a guy whose name is Coy Griffin. He's a New Mexico County Commissioner and uh, the founder of a group called Cowboys for Trump. And his case was interesting because Griffin never um, entered the building. He merely crossed over into a restricted area on the Capitol grounds. And it was a kind of a test case for whether or not that charge was really going to stick. Um, it, it involved sort of a nuances of crossing um, Secret Service uh, security lines. Anyhow, moving forward, I, you know, the next, the next trial that I think I'm gonna pay close attention to is coming at the end of April. And it's a defendant named Thomas Webster. He's a former NYPD officer, in fact, a, quite a high ranking NYPD officer. And, um, so you have a, an ex-cop who was on the front lines of the Capitol fighting with cops. And not only fighting with cops, but his defense is going to be that he was acting in self-defense, that the cops were actually attacking him. So it really kind of pushes right to the forefront this, this notion of this tension between Trump supporters on the one hand kind of being back the blue, pro-police um, people, but on the other hand, being very uh, involved in assaulting police officers on January 6th. You know, beyond that, these trials are gonna go through 2022 mm -hmm. and I would not be surprised if some pushed into 2023. So, you know, you had mentioned in your introduction, um, the two kind of militia leader, extremist group leader uh, who have been indicted. That would be Enrique Tarrio, the former chairman of the Proud Boys, and Stuart Rhodes, the founder and leader of the Oath Keepers Militia. Those cases are set to go to trial later in the year, and both um, will kind of have, like the, the Stuart Rhodes case has 10 other defendants attached to it at this point. The Tario case has five other defendants attached to it. At this point, there may be more, but those will kind of be the marquee conspiracy cases where the government will have to lay out its evidence that these far-right extremist groups were involved in pre-planning organization, you know, that led up to the, the events of January 6th. Are there any aspects of January 6th that remain a mystery uh, to us that, that we might learn about through these trials or, or other forms, or do we pretty much know what there is to know about January 6th, and now it's just a question of whether these particular guys are, are guilty or not? So that's been the fundamental question all along. You know, so much of what happened on January 6th took place in the open. Um, you know, as you mentioned, President right. Trump kind of stood up in front of the crowd and, you know, urged people to go to the Capitol. Before that, you know, he had um, um, uh, posted a tweet on December 19th, 2020, announcing the January 6th protest, the political protest that day, and said, it's going to be wild. That public Twitter message triggered an enormous response in the militia world in particular, 
where, you know, prosecutors have started laying out how that tweet was a kind of catalyzing event for far-right extremists who ultimately ended up taking a very central role in the attack. So a lot of this took place right out in the open. That said, there's a lot we don't know yet. And like what? Um, I think, I'm, I'm sorry. Like what, what for example? Well, like what, like, was there um, sort of direct um, organization and planning beyond those who were on the ground that day? You know, one of, there's a couple of things that I'm working on now um, that will suggest that, that many people, not all, by, by any stretch, many people on the ground that day moved in a tactical, almost military style way, right? Um, you know, sort of um, instigating the crowd, pushing it forward, breaching buildings, um, allowing the larger mass of people to, to storm the Capitol. The question is, what is the connection between those people, if any, and others who were not present that day? What is the connection, if any, between the people in the suits who spent much of November and December in, you know, in, engaged in these complicated, often intersecting quasi-legal attempts to overturn the election and the violence that took place on the ground that day? Is there a connection? And if so, what is it? Did the same people who were trying to use obscure laws and sort of constitutional arguments to, you know, and beyond constitutional arguments to, to you know, to, to essentially uh, maintain Donald Trump's grip on power, were they also, some of them, involved in the, the physical attack on the building? And that is, that is not, that is, that is a source of intense scrutiny and mystery. Let me ask you a, a reporting question to the degree that you're comfortable answering it. Uh, I presume that you interview or seek to interview uh, those who were involved, those who maybe had been accused or those at least who were there. Uh, how are you, uh, how do they react to you? You're, you're a representative of the New York Times, which I presume is not at their doorstep every day. Uh, uh, are you the enemy or are you somebody they feel they can and maybe even should talk to look you know uh, you know if you're talking about people who are have already been charged it's, it's not in anyone's interest who is facing federal you know criminal exposure to talk to a reporter from the new york times or anywhere anywhere else um you know look uh, trying to get people um to talk about this stuff uh is difficult on a good day you know sort of you know Bearing a, a business card from the New York Times clearly makes it more difficult. You know, it's a matter of um, just presenting yourself as, you know, a, an honest broker. Like, you know, if, if it's in your interest to talk to me, it's in my interest to talk to you. And perhaps there will come a moment when our interests align and, you know, then you'll be able to uh, speak freely with me. Mm -hmm. But it's... Um, yeah, it's a, it, this is a very challenging assignment. And, you know, attempting to get at um, facts that are not yet part of the record through either Justice Department filings or actions by the, the House Select Committee that's investigating um, January 6th is not easy, but it's doable with sufficient um, cajoling and persistence. Um, the Republican National Committee has described the events of that day as legitimate political discourse. Uh, to me, uh, that's Orwellian language. But um, is it effective language? Is, is it, does that, do those three words, legitimate political discourse for a, a riot, resonate with a good chunk of the electorate? Do we, do we have a sense of that? I mean, you're upstate. Um, I'm, you're upstate, right at this moment. It, does it resonate with folks where you live? It does resonate with folks where I live. I've spoken to you know neighbors about this. Uh, you know, like I can do some basic electrical stuff around the house, but like I won't mess with some serious stuff. Electrician came to my house. We started talking about January sixth, and uh, it got very interesting. Um, you know, look to to answer your question about the RNC. Uh, 
the RNC's position once clarified was that people who were involved in one particular scheme to overturn the election, which is this notion of sort of creating these alternate slates of electors that were going to be sent to Congress to kind of um, challenge in a quasi legal fashion, the, you know, Biden's electoral victory. Um, that was the legitimate political discourse that the RNC was ultimately talking about. You know, that said, there's been a campaign on behalf of both Republican lawmakers and right wing sort of media figures to to downplay the seriousness of January 6th in a number of ways. Right. It was merely the work of tourists. Um, it was actually leftist Antifa activists. Oh, no, it was the FBI who instigated all of this. And, you know, the fact is, um, some of those claims are utterly preposterous. Um, some are, are, are like, have a grain of truth to them. The fact is, not one thing happened on the ground on January 6th. Did some of the, call it 2,000 people or so who went into the building, um, 800 or so of which have uh, been charged, have the experience of walking through a door that was already open, not facing much um, confrontation from police, right? Seeing police like step aside for them, um, going in, taking some selfies, not hurting anyone and not breaking anything and leaving. Yes, there are a lot of people um, who had that experience. Um, and frankly, those people are, um, if they've been charged at all, were charged with misdemeanors and are not facing significant um, penalties on the back. Right. You well, know, you know but obviously that was not the experience of everyone there. We've seen these horrific right. medieval like hand to hand combat scenes with people fighting the cops. And, you know, like so you can't take a part of the truth and represent it as the whole. Uh, we have very little time left. Is there any reason to believe that some of the principal figures that day, including former Mayor Rudolph Giuliani, Donald Trump Jr. or Donald Trump himself could face criminal charges? Yes, there is a reason to believe that. There's nothing formal in the works, nothing public in the works. But if you read into the case filings, it is very clear that the Justice Department is interested in the connections between what uh, former President Trump did, for example, um, and how his actions and words impacted people who did commit crimes on the ground. That, that, is, that is very clear. And it's clear that they are asking questions along those lines. Whether or not charges will be filed remains to be seen. Indeed. Thank you, Alan. Alan Foyer, I appreciate you joining us. Next up, well, the Academy you. Awards. Welcome back. Turning to something a little less dark now, the Academy Awards are this weekend. This year marks the 94th ceremony and will, perhaps for the first time, feature three hosts, all of them women. The Oscars are the culmination of award season, which includes the Writers and Producers Guild Awards, the SAG Awards, and the Golden Globes. Top nominees this year include The Power of the Dog, Coda, Belfast, West Side Story, and King Richard, along with a number of underdogs in the Best Picture category, which has 10 nominees this year. Joining us from Los Angeles, where he writes The Projectionist, the award season's column for The Times, and also the author of Blood, Sweat, and Chrome, an Oral History of Mad Max Fury Road, is Kyle Buchanan. Welcome, Kyle. Uh, can I ask you to go out on a limb and uh, make some predictions about what we're likely to uh, see? I promise not to hold it against you if you prove wrong, and we'll sing your praises if you're right. I won't hold it against myself either, because if I'm wrong, that means something surprising happened. That's always and I good. Root that almost more than being correct. Fair enough. So what, what, what are you looking for? I mean, is Power of the Dog going to walk away with everything? And, and while I'm at it, uh, Coda uh, came as a surprise to me in, in, in winning uh, some of the earlier awards. Um, I suspect it did to you as well. Is, is this the, uh, the dark horse? I, I would say yes. The Power of the Dog has 12 Oscar nominations. You would think because of that, since it's the nomination leader, that it's probably in front position to win Best Picture. I would say it's got Best Director on lock. It's the director, Jane Campion, 
who had been nominated before for the piano. I think it's her time. I think people really respect the accomplishment here. But I also do think that when it comes to best picture, the voters are looking for emotion. They're looking for a feeling that they had. And Power of the Dog is fairly cerebral, whereas Coda, which is this Apple uh, dramedy about a deaf family and their hearing daughter pursuing a singing career, it hits you in that in that emotional place. It has three endings that are practically designed in a lab to tear jerk. And I do think that to some extent, that is what people are looking for right now. I, I think that the audience for the Oscars is a big topic uh, for the voters. Uh, they want something that is probably a little less esoteric and more likely to connect with the viewers of the show. And Coda could be that. So this would be Jane Campion beating out Spielberg and reversing what happened back in 1994 when he beat her with uh, Schindler's List over... Uh, exactly that. Exactly that. And it would also be this, the first time in Oscar history that the Best Director Oscar was won back-to-back -back by women. Last year, Chloe Jaw won it for Nomadland. That's right. Um, are there specific areas that you will be focused on that you you know are looking to, uh, at, at for Sunday night? I'm very curious about what will happen with Coda. Uh, you know, like you said, Clyde, this is a movie that sort of snuck up on everybody in part because it debuted on Apple in August and didn't make much of a splash then. It had previously sold at the Sundance Film Festival last January for a record sum of 25 million. So there were some pretty high expectations that were not necessarily borne out when that movie came out. However, Apple's got deep pockets. It is a movie that connects with people if they do see it. And it has kind of amassed momentum and is now peaking at the right time. So we'll have to see if, if it pulls out two other wins on Oscar night, which are adapted screenplay and Troy Kotzer in supporting actor. He's the father in the film. Then I would say it's probably cruising to a best picture victory. Uh, the award show last year had half the audience on TV that it had the year before. Uh, is this an irreversible trend or are more people streaming it through various services and it's just fogies like me who still watch on TV? But uh, are award shows like this losing steam is basically what I'm asking. I, I think anything that airs on broadcast television is losing steam. Certainly the Oscars are part of that. Every award show, every major television show is going down on the ratings because people just consume television differently. They stream it, they watch it the next day, they watch clips that go viral on Twitter. You know, there's all sorts of ways now that entertainment is watched and expecting anything to lure a young audience to broadcast television is tricky when, as we've seen, a lot of those younger audiences are cord cutters. You know, they, they, they stream pop possibly, but they don't have a basic cable package, let's say. And I think that the Academy has to sort of understand that and accept it. You know, ABC, their broadcast partner, certainly would like it to be otherwise. But the Academy needs to know that there still is this interest in the Oscars, I find at least. You know, our coverage does very well. And certainly uh, the, uh, the idea that the Oscars are elite is, I think, actually a selling point. Uh, ABC and the Oscars have done everything that they can. They're they're trying to introduce an Oscars fan favorite award this year to try to get bigger blockbusters on the show. But I do think that what people respond to is that the Oscars are considered such an elite award. They look to the ceremony to point them towards movies that they might not otherwise watch. Um, I'm, I'm a very big movie goer, but I have not set foot in a movie theater since the start of the pandemic uh, two years ago. Uh, are those of us who like to sit in a darkened theater and watch a large screen, are we, are we basically dinosaurs? And, and, and are we just doomed to irrelevance in terms of, of the target audience? Or, and, and will more and more people be watching film on smaller screens, which to me is, is de almost defeats the purpose of, of movies, but that's, that's me. Uh, it may not be everybody else. No, I, I agree with you, Clyde. I don't think there's anything better than that big movie screen and in being in the dark and sharing a communal experience with other people. Um, is it endangered? In some respects, I mean, certainly comic book movies are doing better than ever, 
But would you get a film like The Power of the Dog in theaters as opposed to on a streamer like Netflix? I'm not sure that there is that same path for, you know, a mid-budget drama that there used to be. And that does concern me a little bit. And I do think that these trends were happening normally, but that the pandemic hastened uh, our habits of watching just about everything on our televisions. I'll be curious to see if that changes over the next few years. But certainly when you have, you know, as many streaming services on the scene as we do now with, you know, more debuting every year, there's an arms race for content. There's an arms race to make these sorts of movies. And there is a desire on the behalf of the streamers to win something like Best Picture to prove that the destination for movies should be in your home and not in a movie theater. Does that change the... Uh, the, the... Does that sort of do away with grand epics in a way? You know, I guess I have in mind, and again, I'm dating myself here, Lawrence of Arabia. I mean, when I first saw it in the theater, I was practically sweating in the theater from the intensity of the sun on this giant screen. I have since seen it on television. It doesn't have the same effect. Uh, are, 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 would David Lean be happy in today's environment, just for example? I doubt it. And, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's increasingly harder for new directors to sort of be the David Lean of their time. Um, certainly to get the sort of budgets to make those sorts of movies, you know? There's very few A-list directors who've come up in the last two decades, you know, people like Chris Nolan, let's say, who command that kind of power. And I think what we're going to see though, is that even if you're not a superhero movie, you have to be an event in some way, you know? People have their reservations about going back to the theaters during a pandemic. But I think also people were already changing their habit of going to theaters when they do have so many options at home. It has to be a special thing that lures them there. Yes. And sometimes you would get a movie like Parasite, which could do that, which could create the buzz in theaters that would lure people to the theater. I'm not sure on the other side of the pandemic how many different types of movies We'll be able to do that. Yeah, Parasite was was a terrific film. Um, are there any issues? Uh, the Oscars seem to be a, a forum for uh, raising issues of the day. Uh, are there any protests or other forms of expression that you're anticipating for Sunday night? I, perhaps Ukraine, uh, maybe other things, uh, or might this be a more traditional uh, Oscar night in which everybody just says thank you? I expect to hear a lot of references to Ukraine and to Zelensky. Uh, we've already been hearing it at some of the other shows leading up to this one. And, you know, I, I find that to be a very instructive case because sometimes I hear from people who say, and this is a fair opinion to have, why would you even bother having something like the Oscars, an award show everybody is getting dressed up at this time of global strife? And I think it's worth noting that Zelensky is an actor, a former actor, who understood the power of image making and narrative to, you know, set free these dreams and hopes of his people. It's the thing that coasted him into office. And I think it's an, indi an indication and a reminder that, that these narratives, that these film narratives have real power and they can change the way we think about ourselves and the world. So to me, it's, it's, Actually, absolutely the right time to celebrate art, you know, to to remind us why art is important. Absolutely. Let me uh, introduce your book, Blood, Sweat and Chrome. It's the wild and true story of Mad Max Fury Road, uh, which won six Oscars in 2016. Um, I confess I've not seen I, I, after the original Mad Max. I, I sort of that was it for me. But uh, but that's me. Um, what about this film? Did you find uh, compelling um, to, to write about. I, I, I confess to, I'm stumbling in a bit of ignorance here because I did not see it. Well, let me tell you, it's <laughs> it's an incredible a tourist action film. And those two things don't typically go together. Usually if you get a really expensive studio action movie, it's cookie cutter, it's, you know, it's safe franchise building and it's executive driven. This isn't. You know, George Miller, who directed Mad Max Fury Road, he did the original Mad Max movies, but he has one of the most eclectic resumes in Hollywood. He also did the Babe series, Happy Feet, The Witches of Eastwick, Lorenzo's Oil. Nobody quite has a resume like his where he can't really be pigeonholed. 
And nobody has the tenacity to fight for a movie like he does and the ability to convince a studio like Warner Brothers to spend through the nose on a crazy action movie that has incredibly deep surprising themes like wealth hoarding by the rich, resource hoarding by the rich, um, uh, you know, all these incredible environmental and feminist principles and also has incredible action scenes that were shot for real. These days, almost everything is shot in front of a green screen and created in computers, but they really went out to the desert, built these wild cars and had probably the most death defying stunts we've ever seen in a Hollywood movie. Wow. So from that perspective, it was a very exciting movie to cover, but I'd also heard really crazy stories about the making of this movie because you do have to kind of be crazy to make it, you know, it's certainly crazy to see it through. And so to talk to people about their experiences on that film, it was juicy, compelling, and surprising. Sounds perfect. Okay, buy that book, folks. Thank you, Kyle Buchanan from Los Angeles. For the New York Times and CUNY TV, I'm Clyde Haberman.